Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning, Lord. It's transforming to us. It's uh, nourishing to our souls. And uh, Lord, uh, we pray that it would just do that this morning. Feed us and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, okay, Matthew chapter 24. We're going to continue in uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Verse 36 the emphasis here the Lord has for us this morning, Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give him meat, give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Now, this chapter that we're in here, chapter 24. It started off with the disciples asking the Lord Jesus for what sign there was going to be when he was, that, that was going to indicate that the world, of the, uh, the, the world was going to come to an end. It was near. And the Lord Jesus in this chapter so far has given several signs. Widespread deceptions, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in, in diverse places, pestilences or pandemics. Uh, 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 and so forth. But now he comes to verse 37, to the sign which he calls the days of Noah. He says this in verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And what, what Jesus is doing here is he's characterizing the days of Noah as days when you could call no one paid any attention. No one paid any attention to God's warning, which he gave in Genesis 6, 6, 3. Genesis 6, 3, God gave a warning when he said, and the Lord said unto, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, for his day shall be 120 years. So this was God saying in this verse, that his spirit was striving with man. He said, and, 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 you, and you say, how was God's spirit striving with man? God's spirit was striving with man because God's spirit was speaking loud and clear through the conscience of man and telling him, your sins are terrible. You need to stop and turn around, repent. But man, during this time of Noah, was not interested in what God had to say about his life. Man was just too busy enjoying his life to be bothered about God. Now, this, 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 uh, this situation where God is striving with man is what happened in the life of Jacob. God, we saw God striving with Jacob when Jacob had lived over 70 years of his life without any regard for God, and then one night God said, that's enough, that's enough, and that was a great night of God striving with Jacob. This is what happened in Genesis 32. This is God striving with Jacob, Genesis 32, 24. Genesis 32, 24, Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw the man, that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Jacob said, and he said, let me go. Sorry, the man said, let me go for the day breaketh. 
And he said, Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto them, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. This was a striving. This was God striving with Jacob. And Jacob, in this striving, said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And then God blessed him with a change of his name from Jacob to Israel. But Jacob responded to God's striving. First of all, Jacob got himself alone that night. And Jacob tried as best he could to pray. And only after he did that, got alone and he prayed, did God meet Jacob and then God unleashed onto Jacob all the striving that had been going on for these 70 plus years where Jacob, where God was striving with Jacob, trying to speak to Jacob, but to no avail. But in that night, that all night of striving, Jacob was broken. He became a broken man. His, his hip was practically broken, it was put out of joint, and that's the point in which God got through to his man. And Jacob came out of that night a completely changed man. After that night of striving with God, Jacob came off of that night with a new name, Israel, with a new direction in life to exercise power that he had with man and with God. It all came about after these years of striving when Jacob was alone that night and prayed his heart out in, the, in, in Genesis 32.9. Genesis 32.9 where it says, Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the God, the Lord which said us unto me, return unto thy country and to thy kindred and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies and all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I'm become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Jacob, for I fear him, lest he come and smite me, and so forth. That was a good thing. That was a good thing, and those were the days of Jacob. Those were the days of Jacob. God striving, Jacob responding, Jacob responded, God striving stopped, and Jacob was blessed with the new name Israel. There was a time when God was striving with Paul. His name at that time was Saul. And Paul responded to God's striving in Acts 9.3. Acts 9.3, as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and shall be told thee what thou must do. So God said to Saul, to Paul, that it was hard for him to kick against thorns. It's hard for anybody to kick against thorns. Those thorns that God was referring to was God striving with Paul in his life, speaking to Paul, telling him it was, he was wrong in his life, that those Christians that he was imprisoning were not people that he should be fighting against, but people that he should join with. And, and that was unthinkable for Paul. So Paul just kept striving, and, 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 it, and it continued until this day. Just like with Jacob, when God knocked Paul down to the earth, to the ground. And then Paul responded with two questions. First question, who art thou, Lord? Second question, what will you have me to do? Because Paul responded that way, God striving with Paul stopped. That was a good thing. And we could call those the days of Paul. And then Paul goes on to write, as we know, most of the New Testament. Those were the days of Jacob. Those were the days of Paul. But here, Christ is not referring to the days of Jacob. He's not referring to the days of, of Paul, but to the days of Noah. And, all, and the days of Jacob and the days of Paul were the same, in a sense, as the days of Noah, because there was this chapter of God striving with Jacob, striving with Paul, just as God was striving with people in Noah's day. But the difference was 
that in the days of Noah, there was no response. No response from man to God's striving. In those days of Noah, man said, I don't care about God. I don't care what God has to say about my life. And there was no praying their hearts out like with Jacob or with Paul in Noah's day. There was no question of, who art thou, Lord? There was no question of, what will you have me to do in Noah's day? But there was with one man, Noah, but, and, and, and no one else, not a mass, nobody else. And so in Noah's day, God said that there was going to be a limit set on his striving with man. In Genesis 6, 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man. God was saying, not always. And then God gave a warning to man, and the warning was 120 years. Genesis 6, 3. Genesis 6, 3, his day shall be 120 years. 120 years. That's what God gave to man. And during those 120 years, just think about it, it's more than a century. During that more than a century, God waited. And he counted down the time. And during that time, he was counting down the time, he was, he, God stopped. He, he was saying, I want man to stop and repent. Because God's saying, I want to stop and repent and not do this judgment. And during those 120 years, we can imagine how man just got more and more emboldened in his ways with the attitude of, look, I do what I want to do, and I get away with it. There's no lightning bolts from the sky stopping anyone down here. So all is fine. All is good. And man felt very comfortable and very secure because man could not see the sands in, in, in God's 120-year hourglass dropping through the neck. He couldn't see that. So there was no anxiety on man's part. He just kept living his life in rebellion against God. And he kind of felt a sort of refreshing liberation in his sin. And God kept waiting over a century, as described in 1 Peter 3.20. 1 Peter 3.20 says, Once... The long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Those were the days of Noah. Those were the days of Noah, days when no one paid attention to God's warning of coming judgment. And this is what Christ said would be the sign before he returned. No one paying attention. Preachers can preach their heart out. Uh, and, and, and uh, 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 about hellfire and brimstone, and it just becomes entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. No one does what, what little seven-year-old Cassidy did last week and, and comes up and saying, I don't want to go to hell. And so she puts her faith in Christ to save her from her sins. You know, uh, it, 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 Jonathan Edwards, very interesting life. You know, in, 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 in 1741, in 1741, Jonathan Edwards preached a famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Mostly, he had that, that whole sermon read out. And mostly, he just read it with really out any passion in his sermon. But that sermon was so powerful, the words were so powerful, that people literally grabbed the pillars in the church, thinking that the ground was going to open up and swallow them down into hell. That sermon, impassionately read by Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, started what's called the Great Awakening in, 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 in America. And it swept across our land, and many put their trust in Christ. But today, not anymore. There's no, there's no fear sweeping across our land of sinners falling into the hands of an angry God. No one's grabbing any church pillars today, fearing the ground's going to open up and swallow them into hell. And this is what Christ is referring to when he says this sign in this Matthew, uh, in verse 37, verse 37, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In those days, before the flood, he says they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were given in marriage. And, and, and until the day that Noah entered into the ark. He says the days of Noah came down to one day when, when the limit was over. But the word that Christ used for eating here when he said they were eating and drinking, there's, there's the, it's a Greek word that 
means they were gnawing on food like an animal, like a, like a, like a lion. It's very much a picture like in Belshazzar's feast in, in uh, Daniel 5. In Daniel 5, it says, Belshazzar made a great feast for to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. And Belshazzar, while he was tasting the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and the princess, his wives, his concubines, might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and wood and stone. The same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. The king saw the part of the hand that wrote, and the king's countenance was changed. His thoughts were troubled, and his knee, joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against the other. He was eating. He was drinking himself drunk with wine in an act of defiance. In the middle of it, he says, bring those vessels out of the temple uh, that came out of the temple in Jerusalem and, so we can get drunk by drinking, drinking out of the God's temple vessels, and that's when the hand came and wrote. And, he, and, and, and the, what the hand wrote was that you were, you were weighed in the balances and you were found lacking, and that was the same night that he was murdered because the Medes and the Persians had breached the wall that very night. Now, Christ describes a scene in verse 40 when he says, Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. So he's describing here a, a, a very agricultural scene, a field, and he's describing it with such a vividness here, here in this verse and the next verse, such a vividness, vividness, it's like he can see, he can see this, and he's telling them what they cannot see. He can see it, they cannot see it. It reminds me of a conversation I had with this last week with the rabbi in which he calls me and, 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 um, <laughs> on the phone, first thing he says, Tom, Tom, uh, 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 tell me you're finished with this Jesus stuff, he says. And, and if you really have something with your Jesus stuff, as he calls it, then, then I want to know. And, and, but so far you haven't told me one thing that convinces me. There's nothing, he tells me, you know. So I, I, I told him, I said, I, I told my friend, I said, I'm describing to you something you cannot see. I said, I can see clearly that Jesus Christ is God, that he's a loving, merciful, and saving God. He wants to save from sin. I can see that. But you can't see that, and I'm trying to describe to you what you can't see. Now, this is the sense in what Christ is doing in these two verses of verse 40 and 41. He's describing something that the disciples can't see, but he sees it vividly. It's like it's happening right in front of him. He sees these two people in the field. He sees these two women at the, at the mill. And so this first scene is of two people that he's seeing working in a field. They're working together. The word here is together, together. They're working together. They're talking together. They're eating together. They spend so much time together because usually their, their work goes from sun up to sundown. And when you look at these two that are working in the field, there's nothing outwardly that you could look at and say, oh, this one's different from the other. They look the same. Nothing outward. These two persons look the same outwardly, but they're as different as day and night, inwardly. But you can't tell. Outwardly. Inwardly, one has trusted Christ as a Savior, and the other one has not trusted in Christ as a Savior. And now Christ describes a great suddenness, and he does this with the word taken in, in verse 40. Verse 40, one shall be taken, taken, in, 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 in the sense of uh, 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 taken, just, just taken. You know, we have this problem right now in Takati where the narcos are coming in there and looking for all the, the young girls, and, and the girls are walking in on the street. This happened 16 attempts in the first two weeks of June, this police Chief of Takati said, 16 times, narcos will come in a van and they'll just take the girl off the street. No one will ever see her again. She goes off for trafficking, who knows where. 
it's the taken all of a sudden. And so this is not in the evil sense, of course, in verse 40, but this is the same kind of idea with this word taken. Suddenly, one is taken. And then the other word that Christ used is the word left. The other one is left, as in left behind. That was a very powerful title that, 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 that uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins uh, chose for their series, Left Behind. No one likes to think of themselves as left behind, missing the bus, too late. But that's the picture here that Christ has painted in these two verses where one is taken and the other is left behind. Now, Christ has already in this chapter said how how, how this is going to happen, how, how one's going to be taken, when he said in verse 31, in verse 31, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So in these two verses, in these two verses here, verses uh, about the, the, the field and the, and the mill, when it says one shall be taken, this is the work of angels. Angels do this. They are the ones who take the one and leave the other behind. And so the scene, the scene here in these two verses, 40 and 41, is such that the two that are working in the field, the two women that are grinding at the wheel, the mill there, they look absolutely the same outwardly. They're friends. They're as close as you can think of. Uh, uh, they're working together, eating together, sun up to sun down, very closely linked to each other. They're so closely linked to each other that when Christ describes this separation between them, the process, process there separating them, he uses the word in Matthew 13, 49, Matthew 13, 41, 49, 13, 49. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Sever, he says, sever. When we think of sever, we think of a blade severing, you, know, you, you, you cut up a chicken and you use the blade to sever the, the, the legs off and the, between the joints and so forth, like carving. This is the word that describes this separation process. It might be between a man and a wife that it, where, where the severing takes place, where one is taken and the other is left. So when Christ returns, the angels will be sent out to do this severing process and gather those who inwardly are really followers of Christ. They've repented. They're saved though, uh, 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 from those who just have an outward show but no inward reality of salvation. And it will be the time when Christ makes good on his promise, which he said in John 14, 2, John 14, 2, in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So it's going to be the angels that bring Christ's own to him so that he can receive them to himself, like a groom receives his bride when, when she's brought to him. It'll be the angels who do this. As it says in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Angels are doing this. Angels. King David saw this clearly when he said that the, that the time was coming when God was going to give a call to the angels in, in, in Psalm 50, verse 5. Psalm 50, verse 5. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. When Christ returns, he's going to call to the angels this call in Psalm Psalm 50, verse 5, gather my saints together unto me. That's what he, and then, and then he, he, you might think he might also add to the angels, and don't you lose one of them. Because he said in John 18, 9, John 18, 9, of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. And those angels will not lose 
any of them when he gives that call in Psalm 50, verse 5, and calls to them, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The covenant that he's referring to is the new covenant. The sacrifice that he's referring to is the sacrifice of Christ's blood, as he said in Luke 22:20. 20, Luke 22:20. 20. Likewise also is the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new testament, or the new covenant, in my blood, which is shed for you. That's the new covenant. It's in his blood. So what Christ will say to the angels in Psalm 50, verse 5, is in essence, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made the new covenant with me in my blood, which is my sacrifice shed for them. Angels play such a vital role in this severing and separating and bringing the saints to Christ, and they know they will. They know it now, and that's why when a sinner repents, and his name is really added to the Revelation 21, 27, Revelation 21, 27, Lamb's Book of Life, what the angels do when one is added is Luke 15, 7, Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, moreover ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And when one sinner repents and turns to Christ, the angels rejoice and they say to each other, there's another one that we're going to gather up and sever out when Christ tells us, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Now, in verse 41, he continues painting. Christ the painter now paints another picture of this severing of two very close to each other, very close to each other, and the picture is now grinding at the mill in verse 41. Verse 41, two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. This is a scene of making flour, making flour from grain. Each house had these type of, um, of mills for making flour, which consisted of two round heavy stones, about two feet, 18 inches or two feet, in diameter, and the one stone was on top of the other stone, and the, the bottom stone didn't move. Sometimes it was cemented down in place, and there was a hole in the center of the top stone, and the lower stone was chiseled in such a way that it fit up a little bit into that convex, into that, that, that hole in the upper stone, and, and, and grain was then poured into this hole in the upper stone, and then on that upper stone, there were sticks attached around the circumference there, and that stone was pushed around. That upper stone was pushed around, and as it went around, it grinded, it ground up the, uh, the kernels of grain to make the flour, which would fall out on the edges. Making flour like that was the work of women, and it was hard work. It was hard work to push that upper stone around. So the two women, there was usually two women around this mill, and they would kind of uh, share the load of pushing the, push, pushing the upper stone around. It's hard work. And this picture that Christ has described here in verse 41 is of these two women pushing the upper stone around. And then all of a sudden, one woman finds that she's alone, and she's pushing the stone by herself because her fellow worker has just been severed, and he's just, she's just disappeared. And again, Christ is painting this picture of a sudden separation between two people that looked the same, but they weren't. And Christ, in another gospel, has actually added another scene. He's the, Christ the painter has painted another scene for us of this severing separation in Luke 17, 34. Luke 17, 34. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. So here's a picture of two men sharing the same bed, and all of a sudden the angel comes with that severing separation, and one man is just taken out of the bed, and the other is left in the bed alone. So what's the lesson of all these? All these paintings, all these pictures that Christ has given to us. What's the lesson? The lesson of the sudden taking and being left behind. The lesson is verse 42. Verse 42. Watch therefore for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Watch is what we're called to do in light of the coming suddenness 
of this severing separation that's going to take place when Christ returns. Watch is a very important word, very important activity for followers of Christ. And God tells us in the Bible that there are four things that we are to maintain a very close watch on. The first thing that we are to watch carefully is in Jeremiah 7, 24. Jeremiah 7, 24. They hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. The first thing that we are to watch carefully for is what the Bible calls our evil heart. Our evil heart. We have a traitor inside of us. That's shocking to say, but it's true. We have a traitor inside of us, and that traitor is our evil heart. Just as Judas Iscariot was one of the 12 apostles within the inner group of the apostles, we have a Judas Iscariot inside of us, and it's our heart that is wicked and that is evil. Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Our hearts are not just wicked. The Bible says our hearts are desperately wicked without hope. Wicked. And our hearts are deceitful above all things. And when a person thinks that he or another person has a good heart, he's a good-hearted person, he's deceived. Because no heart is good. Christ said in Mark 10, 18, Mark 10, 18, Jesus said unto him, there's none good but one, and that is God. So that's the first thing that we need to keep a very, very close, careful watch on, our evil hearts, our deceitful hearts. Just because it feels good does not mean that it is good. Because God has given us a head and an understanding and a Bible to know what is good. And he wants us to use our head, use our understanding, use our Bible, and keep a close watch on our hearts that God says in Proverbs 4.23, Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And that Hebrew word for diligence in Proverbs 4.23 is the word mishmar, mishmar, which is the same word that's used for a prison guard whose responsibility is to watch the prisoner. So the first thing we are to watch is our evil hearts. The second thing that we are to watch carefully is Mark 14, 38. Mark 14, 38. Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. So the second thing we carefully watch for is temptation. Like the hymn says, great hymn, I want a principle within of watchful godly fear, a sensibility of sin, a pain to feel it near. I want the first approach to feel of pride or wrong desire, to catch the wandering of my will and quench the kindling fire. That's a great hymn. That hymn was written by Charles Wesley, and it's called I Want a Principle Within. It's in our hymnal, it's hymn number 568. It's a prayer that we should all pray for what he calls in the hymn a sensibility of sin, a, 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 a feeling for sin. He calls it a pain to feel it near. That's what it means to watch carefully for temptation. It means to feel a pain when temptation to sin is near, as the hymn says, of pride or wrong desire to catch the wandering of my will, and quench the kindling fire. That's what it means to watch carefully for temptation. It means to feel when pride comes, to feel when, when my, my, my will is wandering into sin, and put out that kindling fire. Kindling fire is the start of a fire, which is kindling wood. So the second thing that we are to watch carefully for is temptation. The third thing we are to watch carefully for is James 1.27, James 1.27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to keep himself unspotted from the world. The third thing we are to watch carefully is the world. And not let the world make us filthy, dirty inside. The world is very subtle. The world wants to change the way we think 
that change the way we view things. We're told in Romans 12.1, Romans 12.1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So when the Bible says in Romans 12 too, be not conformed to this world, that means to watch, to not let the world squeeze our thinking into its mold of thinking. We want the Bible to squeeze our thinking into the Bible's mold of how we should think, like the Bible thinks, not like the world thinks. And we're to watch carefully the world because the world is a seducer. The world is trying to seduce us and we're to make sure that we don't end up uh, falling in love with the world. It says in 1 John 2.15, 1 John 2.15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So this is the third thing that we are to watch carefully for. The world, the world, we have to be careful. The world does not influence our thinking away from how the Bible wants us to think. And, and that the world, we have to make sure the world's not successful in seducing us to love the world. Finally, the fourth thing that we are to watch carefully is our verse, verse 42, verse 42. Watch therefore, for you not know not what hour your Lord doth come. We're to get up every morning and think, I wonder if Christ will return today, and if he does, am I ready to meet him? No anchors of affection on me that's going to cause me to be like Lot's wife and turn back. It's a good thing during the day to go outside and look up, look up, physically look up at the sky and say, soon he's going to come. And that's called looking up and lifting up our heads. When Christ talked about that in Luke 21, 28, Luke 21, 28, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. And all of this is what the Bible calls loving Christ's appearance. Loving his appearance in 2 Timothy 4, 6, 2 Timothy 4, 6, where Paul said, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Love his appearing. This is what the Bible calls our blessed hope, our blessed hope. In Titus 2.13, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So there you have it. Four things that we are to watch carefully. Our evil hearts, temptation, the world, and the return of Christ. But of all those four things to watch carefully, it's the last one, watching for the return of Christ, that is the most important. Why? Because if we're expecting Christ to return at any moment, then we're going to be watching with that expectation that will cause us to Watch our evil hearts to keep them from, uh, keep them under control so that we won't be ashamed when Christ returns. That'll cause us, that watching for the return of Christ will cause us to watch out for temptation so that not, we're not caught by Christ in a sin that causes him to be angry with us. That watching for the return of Christ was going to cause us to resist the world's temptation, the world's seductions, because we'll be acutely aware of the fact that this world's not our home. And at any moment, we're going to leave, and be in, in the time of our departure will be at hand. Now the Lord turns to another analogy to further drive home this point, and it's about a thief. It's about a thief. This is the constant fear of thieves. You know, over the 35 years that I've lived in, in, in El Cajon, where I live, my next door neighbors at that time, Bob and Dottie Dan Ham Hammond, Bob and Dottie's house, Bob and Dottie's house was robbed three times. It was so bad 
with Dottie that, that, that she put nails up in the walls of the cabinet under her bathroom sink, and that's where she hung her jewels. <laughs> and there. and I, I've never, we've never been robbed, but I'm, but I'm, especially after my wife died, I'm constantly afraid we're going to be robbed. So I'm constantly setting the alarm to the house when I, when I, whenever I leave. And the same in Loretto. I'm constantly thinking, is this a vulnerable place here where a bandito could break in? As a matter of fact, the, the casita part of, of uh, my house down there has bars on the windows. And, 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 and I put in fake, t I shouldn't even tell you this, but I put in fake TVs on timers in, in, in the bedroom so that when it gets dark outside, the fake TV has a series of flashing LED lights going on against the drapes and it makes it look like somebody's in there watching television. And, and, and in my house, there are 12 security cameras, very obvious places with blinking blue lights. And in, and in addition to the security lights that are activated by motion, and, and, and sometimes we have a problem with kids that come, and sometimes whole families will come when no one's there, and they'll just have a party at the pool. And so now we have the ring system that activates the cell phones when we, we can talk, say, hey, what are you doing there? And, 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 and in fact, in Loretta one time, I toured a house that was built by some Americans, and they, they put into their house a safe room that they could run into with a metal door in case the robbers came and to wait till the robbers went away. And, and in Loretto, every time there is a robbery, it's posted on Facebook with, with pictures, and, 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 and we all know the robbers always come off the beach to break into the home. My neighbor has been robbed in Loretto, so I'm constantly locking doors and checking the doors to make sure they're locked. As a matter of fact, I put a fluorescent tape uh, on all the latches of the sliding doors and the kitchen door that glow in the dark, so I can tell if a door is locked or not. As a matter of fact, I, uh, uh, before I go to sleep in Loretto, I stand in this one place downstairs where, where, all the, where I can see all the doors, and I use this very focused LED flashlight on all the doors, and I can see all the tape, and I can see the deadbolt in the, in the door. And so I'm constantly on guard uh, against the banditos. Now, I've never been robbed before, but I'm just afraid of it all the time. I'm thinking the banditos are watching me all the time. That's why I'm telling them they're looking for their opportunity. Because and thieves don't, don't break in when, when a person is away at night. Thieves come when people are asleep at night. That's why the home alarm systems have the setting of away, as in away from home, or at home, where, where at home it activates the alarms that are just on the outside doors and it doesn't activate the motion sensors inside. Now, I know this experience because I sometimes forgot and, and I open the outside door and the alarm goes off and the neighbors don't appreciate that. There's an American in, in Loretto, and he kept having his garage broken into. And so he, 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 he decided to, to, to go into the garage in, in, in the dark with his 22 rifle. He had a license for a 22 rifle, and he waited in the dark until the robber came back, and, and he broke in, and then he shot him. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened down there. Now, this is what the Lord is referring to. This, not shooting people. <laughs> <laughs> He's referring to this spirit of being constantly on guard and realizing that robberies will happen at the time when you don't expect it. And Christ said, if a person knew when his house was going to be broken into, then he'd be sitting there like that American in the garage with his, with his rifle. But we don't know when a robbery is going to occur, and it's just a time when we don't expect that the robbery does happen. And that's the point that the Lord is making here. Just like the thief in the night comes when people are at home at sleep. You know, when I go to the grocery store, I set the alarm on. Why? Because when I go to the grocery store, I think to myself, a robbery's going to happen now. I run down and get a, get a, get a can of tomatoes. It, it, it could happen. So I set the alarm off. I set the alarm, put the alarm on just to go to the grocery store. I remember when Pastor Jim, he used to leave his house and when he was outside, he, he would yell, okay, Charlie, take care, and I'll be back soon. <laughs> he used to do that. There was nobody named Charlie there. <laughs> but the dog, the dog was named Charlie, so he was talking to the dog. But it was a signal for the banditos are listening. They're around. You don't know where they are. When, at night, before I go to sleep, I set the alarm at home. Why? Because before I go to sleep, I think to myself, a robbery can happen tonight while I'm asleep. And, and I set the alarm. 
All of this is to protect against robbery. And the best way to protect against robbery is to stay on guard, think that the robbery can happen today, tonight, and then ask the question, what have I done to prevent the robbery from happening tonight? Set the alarms, shine the flashlight on the locks, and confirm the lock. And, and sometimes, sometimes it, it has happened that I get up in the morning and I find that I left the door open all night. And I'm telling you, it just, it, it sends a fright through me. And then I go, and you know what I do? You think I'm crazy, I do this. Uh, I go through every room in the house, every closet, every bathroom, e everything, and make sure a bandito hasn't snuck in and he's hiding in there, you know. All of this is bandito consciousness. And, and, and that same on guard consciousness is what the Lord is talking about in verse 43. The person who has this bandito consciousness is always ready for the bandito. In fact, he's so ready for the bandito that if the bandito did come, the person would actually say, I've been expecting you. <laughs> like the American in his garage in Loretto with his rifle. In essence, he said to the, the bandito, I've been expecting you. I'm ready for you. And he shot him. Right. This is what the Lord is saying in verse 43, that we should be so on our guard for the return of Christ, by keeping our evil hearts under control, by resisting temptations, by fighting against the seductions of the world, all this because we don't want the Lord to catch us in some compromising sin when he returns. And just as a person is bandito conscious, that he would say to the bandito, I've been expecting you, I'm ready for you, in the same way, Christ wants for us to be return of Christ conscious, so that when Christ does return, we would say to Christ, I've been expecting you. I've been, and I'm ready for you. We set, we set burglar alarms. We use dead bolts on our doors, sometimes bars on the window to keep our houses safe. But the houses in Christ's day were more vulnerable because he said in verse 43, verse 30, 43, we know this, that if the good man of the house had known at what time watch for the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. He said broken up. Now, Christ is talking about a house that would be broken up. And, and what he meant there is that the word literally broken up there means dug through, dug through. And because houses in those days were made out of uh, sun-dried bricks or mud or just loose stones piled on top of each other. So a forced entry in his day did not have to be through a door or a window. The wall would just be dug through. And that's the meaning of the Greek word there in verse 43 for broken up. And the worst fear is the thief in the night. And the only, pro uh, uh, only protection is to be prepared, to be ready. And the spirit of being ready is what is being emphasized here. And this is what the Bible is emphasizing. This is why it keeps on using this example of the thief in the night with this unexpected suddenness of the thief in the night that we should be prepared for. 1 Thessalonians 5.2, 1 Thessalonians 5.2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 1 Thessalonians 5.4, 5, 5.4, 5, 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. 2 Peter 3.10, 2 Peter 3.10, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away. Revelation 3.3, 3, Revelation 3.3, 3. Remember therefore now uh, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know the hour I will come unto thee. Revelation 16.15, Revelation 16.15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And that's why Christ has one word, one word to emphasize that what we are to do with regard to his sudden and surprising return, and that word is verse 44, verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. The word's ready. That's like being prepared for the, red, for the bandito. It reminds me of the, the, the couple who lived in Arkansas and they have tornadoes there. And so every time that there would be a tornado warning, the couple would rush down into their basement and the tornado, and their tornado shelter down there, and every time they'd come up and, and everything was okay. 
And one time the couple heard the warning and they rushed down into their tornado basement shelter. And when they came out, everything was destroyed. All the houses were destroyed, just flattened like the, the town. And the man said, now that's what I like to see when I go into a tornado shelter. <laughs> Now the Lord turns all of this into a penetrating question in verse 45. Penetrating question. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Here we can see the Lord looking squarely into the eyes of each of the listeners and he says, who then? As if to say, is it you? Is it you? Are you that faithful and wise servant that's going to be prepared and ready for when I return? Is it you? And we can imagine here the Lord doing the same thing for each one of us, looking at us individually, squarely, and asking the question, who then? Is it you? Is it you, the faithful and wise servant? Are you the one? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for these words which, Lord, are very refreshing to us. And they cause us to, uh, to just stop and take stock and ask the question, Lord, are we ready? Are we prepared? Are we looking up? Help us to do that in Jesus' name, amen.